Category 5 TV with Hillary Rumble, Krista Wells, Eric Kidd, Rachel Zhu, and Robbie Ferguson. And now, here's a clip from Category 5 Technology TV. Brought to you by EcoAlkaline's environmentally responsible batteries, cat5.tv slash eco. So we're here today at St. John Ambulance with Mia. Mia is an, the AED coordinator for St. John Ambulance. And she's here to talk to us a little bit about how technology is saving lives every day. Um, your heart works by electrical impulses. So there are specialized cells in your heart that trigger the pumping activity by sending these electrical impulses. And most people go by day to day, never giving any thought to this until it stops working. And then it becomes really important to them. So Mia is going to help us understand how to get the heart pumping again using technology. Here's Mia. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to look for a defibrillator, an AED. Uh, they'll be on the wall at an arena, at schools, at the shopping mall, wherever it is, you, wherever somebody goes down. So as soon as the person hits the floor, um, and you realize that they are in fact unconscious and we touch them, are you okay, you're unconscious, then we want to send for 911 immediately. And what we also need is we need the AED to come as quickly as possible, the defibrillator to come as quickly as possible. For every minute that they are on the floor and they are not being shocked by the defibrillator, they are losing 10% chance of survival. So if the ambulance doesn't come for 8, 9, 10 minutes, that's... That's 80 or 90 percent. Right, right. So it's really important that you get the machine there as quickly as possible. You do not need to be trained to get the machine off the wall and get started. The key to using a defibrillator is follow the prompts. Do what the machine tells you to do. So as long as you know uh, at least a little bit of CPR, we can't harm the casualty with the defibrillator. We can't kill him. He's dead if we're using the CPR, doing CPR. Okay, so there's nothing we can do to harm him. The only thing that we can do is harm the people who are near him if somebody is touching him while I shock them. So as long as I'm not touching, we're good to go. Okay, so obviously the AED is going to deliver a shock. Can you just explain how this system works and what, why we're going to use it? Okay, so what the machine does is the machine does not detect whether he has a pulse or he does not have a pulse. What the machine is going to do is it's going to, um, once you put the pads on, it's going to read the casualty. If the heart is not beating, it still has electrical activity that you were talking about a little bit earlier. So the machine is not, or the heart is not beating, it has some electrical activity. The machine is then um, uh, programmed to recognize the electrical activity. So it's not beating, there's no pulse, but it is quivering. So what the machine does is it then shocks with uh, probably about 360 joules through the casualty. It shocks the heart into stopping the quivering to actually allow the heart to kick in on its own using its own pacemaker. So in fact, most people believe that the AED starts the heart, but in fact the AED doesn't start the heart. It stops the misfire of the heart to allow the heart to kick in on its own. So when we arrive at the scene, uh, we're at the arena and the person drops in front of us. Uh, the first thing we want to do is make sure the area is safe for yourself. You don't want to go into anything that's going to be dangerous to yourself. So as long as I'm safe, then I'm going to come in and I'm going to check the casualty and see if he's conscious. Check him for consciousness first. So I'm just going to tap him. Hey, are you okay? Hey, can I help you? And there's no answer. So I'm immediately going to send somebody for 911 and to bring me back an AED if there's one available. So while somebody is bringing me the defibrillator, I'm checking breathing, I'm doing my two breaths, and I'm starting my CPR until the machine arrives. The machine trumps the person. So as soon as the machine arrives, I stop what I'm doing, I turn on my machine, and I follow the prompts. So first thing I want to check on my casualties, I want to do the ABCs. A, airway. Airway needs to be open and clear. So I do a head tilt, chin lift. So I'm going to tilt the head back, get the tongue off the back of the throat. Then I'm going to B, check for breathing. So I'm going to get down nice and close, check for breathing for 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If he's not breathing, I'm going to give him two breaths. Plug the nose, breathe. Just enough air to make the chest rise. And a second breath. And then I would start C go right into CPR, chest compressions, 30 chest compressions, one and a half to two inches in depth. And I continue to do 30 compressions and two breaths until the AED arrives. As soon as the AED arrives, I stop what I'm doing, turn on the machine, and I go from there. Assuming that we've done a little bit of CPR, then we're going to turn the machine on. 
Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut clothing. All machines needed. come with a little bag, and then you dump out your little bag, and it has everything that you need. So you might need to have some scissors to cut the clothes. When the patient's chest is bare. Remove protective cover and Got take some gloves, white adhesive pads, and a mask to protect myself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I would then uh, dry the casualty. If the casualty is is um, very With hairy, I need to bare. shave him first Remove and then dry. Protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. So I follow the prompts. Remove the cover. Take out the pads. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's the bare skin. The pad has a picture. It shows me exactly where I need to put it, so I follow what the picture when tells me. the pad is in place, look carefully at the picture on the second pad. Peel the second pad from the yellow plastic liner. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press Again, firmly there's a to picture. patient's bare skin. No one should touch the patient. So we need to move back. Analyze I'm clear. It. We all need to be clear. Ideally, we'd like to be a good 12 inches away. So we're no all clear. Okay. To Don't touch the patient. Stand clear. Analyzing. Shock advised. Stay clear. Okay. So we're going to get ready to shock. I'm going to push the button, but before I push it, I must confirm no one's near. Shock Don't touch him. I'm going to shock. Shocking now. Shock delivered. Shock delivery. Be sure emergency medical services have been called. We called already, so we're good. To touch the patient. Begin CPR. For help with CPR, press the flashing blue button. So I'll push the flashing blue button because I might be confused. In the center of the chest, between the nipples. Place your other hand on top of the first. Push the chest down firmly two inches. Keep time with the beat. Elbow straight, heel of the hand down in the center of the chest, pushing down about one and a half to two inches for an adult casualty. Each who nose, tilt head, and give two full breaths. Breathe. Breathe. Continue with compressions. So we follow the prompts. Do what the machine tells us. Again, this is an adult casualty, anybody over eight years of age. But I can also do it on a child from age one to eight. We can't hurt the casualty because he's already dead. So anything we can do is better than what he is. Just do what it says until whoever is trained knows, takes head, over for you. And give two full breaths. Breathe. So even if you don't know how to do CPR, this machine is going to tell you what to do very calmly because this can be a really stressful situation. So it just walks you through the process. Are all AEDs like this? Um, no, not exactly like this. They all push the button for shock, uh, but they don't all tell you what stop to do for CPR. the CPR. Oh, stop CPR. No one should touch the Okay, patient. so let's move back. Are you clear? Stand clear. Don't touch the casualty. Clear. You can. Oh, shock advice. Stand clear. Get your finger ready. Before you push it, make sure no one's standing. I'm going to shock him. Don't touch him. Shocking now. Now, shock delivered. It is safe to touch the patient. Begin CPR. And then we just keep going. Um, okay, so here's some examples of some different kinds of machines that you might come across. All the machines do the same thing. They are all shock boxes. So whether it's a green one with lots of pictures, or if it's this one that you just push the button and it turns on by itself, or this one that we just practice with, they all do exactly the same thing. So each machine is a little bit different. Turn it on. Once you get it on, follow the prompts and you're good to go. They all shock the casualty. Um, and you were mentioning, Mia, that uh, this is safe for somebody over eight years old, but then you mentioned that between one and eight is okay. Uh, could you just clarify that for me? Like, what would happen if, say, my three-year-old were to have, have a problem at the pool or something? Uh, we can still use it for a child. There are pads that are specifically designed for children age one to eight, but not all machines carry them. In fact, very few do. So if you, don't, if you see a pad separate that says child pad, then you would use that. But if you don't see it, and most machines don't have them, then you would just use adult pads on a child. Um, and that's safe to do if, if it's not available? Yes, but we just do not use um, a defib on a child under one. 
it's it's not proven to be effective so we don't and it's it's a lot of joules for a small body and as far as the CPR goes for those who uh, don't know how to do CPR is it that's safe and and you can do that the same as well for somebody under eight uh, yes yeah, for a child we're gonna push a little bit less about one-third to one-half the depth of the chest so we push less and we give less air because their lungs are smaller and their chest is smaller so you can use one hand or two to push for a child it's totally up to you as long as you push less um, so about less than half the, the chest depth and give less air, but it's still 30 compressions and two breaths. No difference there. Just push less. One of the, one of the things that you were talking about as well was uh, drying off the patient's chest mm -hmm. or the, the casualties chest. Um, so in that case, like when you say dry it off, are we just drying the area that's going to be uh, in contact with the pads or are we actually going to like give them a good scrubbing or what's the, what's the idea? Um, what we're trying to do is the pad itself has to, has to have at least 80% contact on the chest. So that's why if the casualty is very hairy or if he's wet, when I put the pad on top, it's not going to stick. If it doesn't stick, then the um, energy that's coming from pad to pad will in fact skim over the top of the casualty and we don't want that to happen. We want it to go in the casualty through the heart and to the other pad and back the same way. Um, the electrodes come through, uh, through the electricity comes through the body. So we want it to be um, dry. We want to take the, um, if you're obviously outside in the, in the way, rain, pouring rain, try to get them to a dry location. But if it's a little bit um, spitting, as long as it's dry and you put the pads on top um, of dry skin, then you're good to go. Where can we expect to see a defibrillator, uh, as in like when we would encounter a situation where it's necessary, where, where would you expect to see one? Uh, basically in every public place you could uh, see a defibrillator. When you arrive um, at a building, let's say you go to the library or to an arena, when, you're, when you um, come in the front doors, it should have some kind of a sign on the front door that says that there's an AED there. Um, and if you see the sign, then you know that there's an AED usually in the front as soon as you arrive on the scene. So that, let's say I'm at an arena, and I'm watching my kids play hockey and the person besides me goes down, he hits the floor, I start my CPR and I send the nearest person to get that machine off the wall. Even if I'm not trained, they'll pull it off the wall and bring it to me. When you pull it off the wall in almost every case, especially in a public place, um, an alarm system will go off. And so the person who is trained to use it will hear the alarm or somebody will go and get the person who's working at the arena to then uh, come and use the machine. But in the meantime, if, if that person is at the back of the arena, it could be, you know, four or five minutes before they get to the front. So you've lost 50% chance right there. So the quicker you can get the pads on the casualty, the better chance they have. Just put on the pads, follow the prompts, and until somebody else arrives on the scene and, and takes over for you. So is this powered by plutonium or like what, what keeps this thing running when it's just hanging on the wall there? And the machine has a lithium battery and the, most of the machines have um, lithium batteries that are good anywhere between three and five years. So this is rechargeable? Uh, no, it's not. It's not, eh? it's not rechargeable. So once, um, after you use the machine, obviously you have to uh, put new pads on and everything. The machine will need to be serviced. But the machine itself actually checks itself. Every AED checks itself at 3 o'clock in the morning. So it self-checks and it will tell you if it's sick. So the little light will come on to tell you and the person, wherever the machine is, they are supposed to look at the machine daily to make sure that the, the little light is on. It's still green and it's ready to go. If the battery is low, it will start to beep to warn them, time to get a new battery. Even if the machine is beeping, low battery, low battery, you're still going to use it because you, stood, you still, in most cases, have a good 15 shocks left even in a low battery situation. So you use it until the machine stops. Is there any chance that this could shock a person who is in normal rhythm? No. Uh, the machine itself does not detect a pulse. As I said before, it only detects fibrillation. So it's looking for two different kinds of rhythms, and it only detects those rhythms. So the machine itself cannot shock somebody with a pulse. Um, but it, in, in, in return, it doesn't know what a pulse is. So it only shocks the two rhythms, um, the fibrillation ones that we were talking about, or tachycardia where it's going a little bit too fast. It only knows certain rhythms, and it knows if I feel these rhythms, I should shock it. And so that's, so it can't, cannot shock somebody with a pulse. So I couldn't, you know, use it and slap it on at a Christmas party or something and shock <laughs> somebody. Um, it, it, it will say, uh, what the machine will say is no shock advised, and then you would then uh, look for any signs of life, movement, coughing, vomiting. If there's no sign of life, start CPR and, and keep doing it. Because when you use the machine, it doesn't always say shock. 
it could be a non-shockable rhythm. And you can go do a little CPR for your two minutes and it could pump it, put it into a shockable rhythm. And that's our goal. As long as it says to shock, it means we're, we're on the process of saving him. And if it says don't shock, then don't shock, we do just CPR. So Mia, what if you encounter someone who already has an implanted pacemaker? Uh, if you arrive on the scene, what you're going to do when you bear the chest, you would notice because they're going to have a scar. That's how you're going to know it's a pacemaker. So when you see the scar in the chest, you're going to put your hand over the scar and you should feel what feels like a loony or a toony underneath it. If you feel that, you want to make sure that when you put the pads on the casualty, that the pads are at least one inch away from the casualty or from the, um, from the pacemaker. Right. So as long as they're about one inch away, then, then you're okay. You can go ahead and use it. In almost every case, we're going to use... Um, use it regardless because the casualty is not living and it's not breathing so anything we can do is better for instance a pregnant casualty um, we're going to use it for a pregnant casualty also if there's a lot of jewelry we might need to move it but it's not my my main priority I'll, I'll try my best um, so that's pretty much and also if I see a patch on the casualty he might have um, or she might have a patch medication that they would have on um, such as nitro nitroglycerin so the patch is on we need to remove that patch first so ideally I would use my glove to remove the patch and don't stick it on yourself and don't stick it on yourself because again if I touch it with my bare hands it the um, medication will be absorbed through my body and it will make me sick or I can use um, a cloth um, the end of my shirt, anything to pull the patch off, wipe it down, and then go ahead and use it. And if you don't know what the patch is, because it, it could be, you know, a birth control, it could be something to stop them from smoking. Uh, I don't know what the patch is. I'm not going to take the time to read it. Just pull whatever patch you see off um, and go ahead and put the pads on and uh, follow the prompts. Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward. So Mia, we'd just like to thank you for joining us, um, doing a feature on Category 5 TV. Um, how, so how can people get more information on AEDs? If they're looking for more information about AEDs or the, to purchase one or to get training so that they can uh, use the machine um, a little more confidently, uh, they can uh, refer to our website at www.sja.ca. Great. Thanks so much. And hopefully you'll never have to use one of these, but if you run into the occasion, then now you'll know how to use an automated external defibrillator. Category 5 TV is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. Thanks for watching.